Good. Yeah, now we're good. I'm not going to add any more, very much more to what Dale just said, except to say this. Um, Dale was special to us before he was special to you. That's all I'm going to say. Even Janelle. Uh, yeah, I, I really, uh, and I think I said this last time I was here, I really uh, enjoyed working with Dale for the summer in Anchorage. He was an able uh, helper uh, and very, very much a part of several of the uh, Bible studies we had that summer with, that eventually led to people uh, obeying the gospel and putting on Christ. And I'm very thankful, thankful for him and his family, his brothers, his parents, thankful for the opportunity to um, to be here tonight. I'm going to, I mentioned this, I think, to Holly uh, this week. I'm going to approach this subject a little bit differently than maybe you've heard it in the past. Now, by the end of the lesson, we're going to come back probably to, to things that you've heard before uh, when you have heard people talk about this subject. There's whole books. Apologetics Press has books written by their writers about this subject. I'm not going to be able to improve upon uh, what you would learn from them, okay? And I'm not, even, I'm not going to make an attempt uh, to do that. We will talk about some of the things that, uh, that Eric Lyons and Kyle Butt and some of the David Miller and some of the others from Apologetics Press mention when they teach about this or when they write about it. We will eventually get around to that, but I do want to take a little bit different tack, and I think you'll notice that when we get started. First, let me, um, let me affirm uh, that the Bible is indeed not boring. That, that's one of the uh, themes that you have as well, right? That uh, the Bible is not boring. I was, uh, we were blessed uh, one year when we were in the Osho, Missouri to have, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, forget his name, but uh, somebody, I'll remember it in a second, but brother that has passed away, he was at Freed Hardeman, uh, has passed away within the last five years ago or so that uh, had been preaching the gospel for 65 years and had been a serious student of the Bible for almost, uh, almost 70 uh, years. And he was uh, at our house in Anderson, Missouri. We lived on the creek, and he and I were out on the back porch while Maria was getting lunch together. And uh, 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 Woodson, uh, William Woodson, yeah, that's it. I told you I'd remember it. Uh, and he told me while we were sitting out there uh, waiting, waiting to start lunch, he said, uh, Pat, I've been, I've been a Christian for a long time, and I've been studying the Bible for a long time. Uh, and one of the things I love about the Bible is that every single time I pick it up, I see something new. And that had a deep impact on me because, to be honest with you, before that, I, I can't honestly say I was all that diligent of a Bible student. And sometimes I looked at it kind of as a chore, kind of something that I had to do instead of something that I got to do. And, you know, Brother Woodson, some of you knew Brother Woodson, uh, absolutely a brilliant genius, uh, brilliant scholar of, of the Bible. And for him to lay that kind of groundwork for me to begin my serious uh, Bible, uh, life of serious Bible study, I I'm greatly appreciate that uh, from him. The Bible is not boring. If the Bible is boring, the problem is with us and not with God and not with His Word. Uh, and I'm obviously thankful for the uh, invitation to come here to address the question, why does God allow evil to exist? But uh, as a way of introduction and to lay the proper groundwork before we begin to look at that question, I want us to consider another question. How many of you have had someone uh, say to you or how many of you have said to somebody else, uh, do you know Jesus? Have you said that before? Have you had somebody else say that to you? I can't even count the number of times that somebody has said uh, that to me. And that is a, it really is a pretty good question, right? Uh, but there is a better question, and that's what I, what I want to start with tonight. This is a very familiar passage probably to all of us from Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, where Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Uh, and many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice 
lawlessness. You see, what we learn from Jesus here is that although knowing Jesus is important, it is immeasurably, exponentially, and eternally more important that Jesus knows us. Because the world, anybody can say they know Jesus, but the, the real litmus test here that we learn from Jesus in Matthew 7 is, does He know us? Now, you and I know that Jesus is God, and, and uh, literally speaking, Jesus knows everything. But what He's saying here is He did not know them in a way that He had a relationship with them, even though they felt like they had a relationship with Him. He didn't recognize them as belonging uh, to Him. So sometimes... Sometimes we allow the religious world, like with this phrase, do you know Jesus? We, we allow the religious world to mold us in one direction or another and maybe get us thinking one way or another. And I believe that that is what has happened with the question of the evening uh, tonight. I, I believe that although uh, the question, why does God allow evil to exist in the world today, is a very popular question to ask, just like, Somebody saying, do you know Jesus? I believe that perhaps a better question to consider is this. Why does God allow good to exist in the world today? Have you ever thought about it that way before? Because I would submit to you, we're going to find out in a minute, that's a better question. Because, you see, He didn't have to. God did not have to allow good to be in the world. You know, from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, to Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, everything was perfect. There was no evil. The universe and all that was created was in harmony. And then, Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, changed it all. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. You see, Eve saw, she took, and she ate of the fruit God had forbidden. You know what happened after that? The world turned upside down. The covenant relationship between man and, the, and his creation was broken. Sin entered the world, and with it, punishment, suffering, and evil became a reality. It's interesting to note, and if you have your Bibles, turn over there with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 22. It's interesting to me, anyways, to note the Godhead's conclusion and response to what had just happened. Again, Genesis chapter 3, verse 22 then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know what? Good and evil. And now, lest he should put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And then he go, they go on in that line of thinking. Before the fall, before Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, there appears to have been no recognition of evil or even the possibility of there being anything such as evil. Because God here is saying, now that they've done this, they can recognize the difference between good and evil. The implication is, before they did this, they could not have. Why? Because there was no such thing as evil. We know that's true because God saw everything that He had made and it was very good. Who said that? God said that. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. At that point, at that moment in time, all that man deserved was physical and spiritual death. How do we know that? Because Paul tells us that. Romans chapter 6 verse 23, right? For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The point that I'm making here is this. Anything good that now exists or has ever existed in the world since the fall of man is a gift from God. He didn't have to do it. We didn't deserve it. Literally, from the original language, it was an endowment 
of divine grace, the very fact that He allows there to be anything good in the world today. So, to ask the question, why does God allow suffering to exist in the world today, is presumptuous at best as His creation, and is placing the emphasis and blame in an improper place. You know, we don't... In the Bible studies that I have with people, I, I kind of joke around a little bit uh, this way uh, uh, when I'm talking to people and when I teach them something from the Bible, sometimes I'll say, well, uh, you believe that, don't you? And, and they said, yes. And I said, why do you believe it? And sometimes they just stare at me. I said, you believe it because I told you, right? I pray to God that nobody ever believes something just because I told them what the Bible said. Because it's our responsibility to study it out and find out what the Bible says for ourselves. Because you know what? I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. And probably will be wrong again, right? Job found this out firsthand, right? With God. When he challenged God and his knowledge, in Job chapter 38, verses 2 through 4, the Bible says this, This is God responding back to Job after Job was questioning God, right? So God says, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. Why? Because I will question you, and you, Job, shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Can you, can you feel the tone in God's voice? He, he's, ta- he's scolding Job because Job, presumptuously, it feels like it's okay for him to question God and question what God, God has done. Think about what Job has been through in his life by the time he's questioning God. Think about all the suffering. Think about all what we would say today as being evil, all the pain he's been through. And when he questions God in that, what does God do? As we used to say, he pinned his ears back, didn't he? He scolded him for that. Now, let's, that's not the only thing he says. Look over in Job chapter 40 and verse 2. Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. And also from Job chapter 40 and verse 8. Who would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me, God, that you may be justified? Do you understand what just happened here? Job was questioning God's morality. He was questioning whether he was in control. He was questioning whether he really had a grip on what was going on in the world, and God let him know real quick, I I know. I know all of this, and I am in control. Why does God allow good to exist is a more appropriate question for the one who fears God to ask and answer. And, And brethren and friends, that's exactly where the problem is, isn't it? That's exactly where the problem is. Because most of the people in my experience, and maybe in yours, uh, who ask this question aren't searching for the truth. Now please, please understand that I know as well as you do, many of you have been through very difficult times in your life, and I understand when difficulties and tragedies hit that sometimes we question God. Guess what? God knows that. God understands that. We have a great high priest who who can sympathize with our weaknesses, right? Because he, like us, was tempted in all points, yet without sin. So I understand, and God understands, that sometimes such severe things happen in our life, like they did uh, with Job, uh, that it shakes our faith. And sometimes we do ask questions of God. The answer to this better question about why does God allow good to exist in the world today, involves the inherent goodness of God. Psalm 100 and verse 5. The answer involves the nature of God as an all-loving God. 
1 John 4 and 8. And it also involves the deepest desire of God for His creation, which is found in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. The previous verse talking about God, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is God's deepest desire. That's God's heart's desire. You know, Jesus is the one that said that God makes the sun to rise on the evil, there's our word, and on the good. And He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45. Why does He do that? The point Jesus is making is God sends physical blessings so that everybody will be blessed, whether they believe and obey God or not. These are blessings that are available to everybody. Now, why would God want to bless people that don't care about Him? Because His greatest desire is for all men to be saved. And He wants them to at least have some chance of giving consideration to Him and obeying him. He does that. He sends the rain so that all will be blessed. God allows good in this world so His crowning creation, you and I, and all mankind who are made in His image will seek, find, and obey Him and ultimately spend eternity in heaven with Him. That's why God allows good to exist in the world today. It really is no more difficult than that. You don't have to jump through theological hoops to find out about that. That's exactly what God wants. He, he wants everyone to be saved. So, since the majority of the world does not believe in God, and since we want them to believe in God, right Dale? We want them to believe in God. We want them to be obedient to the gospel, right? We want them, even those that hate us and hate God, we want them to spend eternity in heaven. Amen? That's right. We want them to because of that. And because that's God's greatest desire, it should be our greatest desire. There should be no other desire you and I have other than the salvation of our soul and everybody else's soul that we can come into contact with. So, since that's true, we need to be prepared. 1 Peter 3.15, right? We meet, need to be ready to give a defense for the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear, right? Why? Because we want them to be saved. We, we, you've heard this said many times over the years, and, it, and it's just as true today as it was the first time it was said. Uh, we, we should not be about trying to win arguments with people theologically. We should be about trying to win souls. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we are prepared to give a defense for why we believe what we believe. And why should we do that? Because whether their questions are presumptuous or not, because of what's at stake, because their souls are at stake, and God wants us to be concerned about souls. You know, I talk about this a lot when I'm teaching classes on personal evangelism. It would be naive at best for you and I to believe that a non-Christian could see the impropriety of questioning God. Why would we expect a person that doesn't even know about God and hasn't obeyed God and hasn't become a Christian, why would we expect them to understand that it's wrong to question God this way? It's wrong to question His motive. It's wrong to question His sovereignty. It's wrong to question His right to rule. It's wrong uh, to question whether he is in control of the universe. Why would we expect them to know that and to believe that? Well, we shouldn't. It's very naive. And so what we have to do is find out where they're at. Uh, isn't that true with all, Eric, isn't that true with all personal evangelism we've done? Uh, we got to find out where people are at so we know how to approach them so that we can have the best probability of winning them for Christ. Isn't that what evangelism is about? Isn't evangelism about raising the probability of people going to heaven? Everybody has the possibility of going to heaven if they will just but listen. But what we need to do is raise the probability of them going to heaven. That, that's where us uh, reaching out to people, being friendly to people, making people feel welcome when they come to our services, making 
contacts within the community with our neighbors, our co-workers. That's what it's all about, is being ready to give a defense for what we believe so that they too will spend eternity in heaven. Let's not fall into the trap of, of saying, well, why don't they know that? Or why don't they believe that? It, it's naive at best to believe that they're going to believe what you already believe. But they need to. They need to come to that knowledge. Because God doesn't just want them to be saved. The end of that verse says, and come to the knowledge of the truth. Right? He wants them to be saved and knowledgeable of the truth. If a faithful man of God, and we don't have to look any further than the first chapter of Job to find out what God thought about Job, but if a faithful man of God like Job could question God, then you know what? You and I are probably going to question Him sometime during our life as well, right? And aren't we thankful that questioning God, even though He might, like He did with Job, He might have something to say about that to us, right? It doesn't mean that He cuts us off when we do that. Because sometimes, because we're human and He created us, He knows, doesn't He? That we're going to question what's going on in the world. We're going to question what's happening in our lives. We, like Job, must realize who God is and that He is in control and knows what we need better than we do, right? God knows what we need better than we ever will. Now, that is the, the groundwork. We've, we've laid the groundwork for our study. So let's, let's now, that's the introductory remarks. I hope we still have some time with. Um, let's uh, begin to try to answer the question of the hour, which is, why does God allow evil to exist in the world today? And again, this part of this question might answer, might be a little bit different than you heard if you've, you've read some of Eric and Kyle's stuff or you've, uh, or you've listened or seen them speak before. Um, I believe that to answer this question, what we need to do is we need to start at the source of a lot of misunderstanding in the religious world, uh, both in and out of the church. And that misunderstanding starts with a passage in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 7. Because if we don't get this right, or if we have questions about this in our own mind, how are we going to explain this topic to other people? And I want to let you know something right now. I have been trying to share the gospel with people for a very long time. And this topic that we're talking about tonight is one of, if not the, most important topic you're going to come up against when you're talking to people about the gospel. Because this topic will keep more people away from giving God serious consideration than almost any other topic you can think of. Well, if there's a God, why is there so much evil? Why is there so much pain? Why is there so much suffering in the world, right? Those of you that spend very much time doing this know that what I'm saying is true, right? So that makes it important. Why? Because we want all men to be saved, just like God does, right? So we need to be ready to give a defense. So one of the things that people are going to bring up is what we're fixing to talk about. So this may be, may be the most important part of the lesson is what we're fixing to talk about from Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. And I'm going to, I, I preach from the New King James Version. I have a lot of different versions that I study from. And what I'm going to read it from here right now is from the 1611 King James uh, Version because it uses a word here uh, that has caused... Uh, a lot of misunderstanding uh, in the religious world. Um, Isaiah 45, verse 7 in the King James Version says, The prophet uh, wrote of God, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. Hmm. Interesting, right? God creates evil. Can you see how somebody who might be critical of the Bible or critical of you for being a believer in God, if they read that verse, they might go, well, what's that mean? Uh, I thought God was good. I thought, I thought everything God created was good. And the end of that verse says, I, the Lord, do all these things. Okay, so like the topic uh, of the hour and like the fact that sometimes phrases and words get hijacked, the meanings of them get hijacked in the religious world. What we need to do is we need to drill down and we need to dig deep and find out exactly what Isaiah uh, 
was uh, saying here in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. First of all, one of the things we... If we believe that the Bible is from God, if we believe that, that all Scripture is inspired by God, right? Uh, if we believe that, then one of the things we have to base our understanding of this verse on is the fact that it cannot have any reference to moral evil. In other words, it cannot be regarding wickedness because if it was, it would be a direct contradiction to the whole rest of the Bible. If it was saying that God created wickedness, then that would put God at odds with Himself and at odds with His nature. And this is because of the holy nature of God. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4. Uh, Jehovah is a God of truth and without injustice. Psalm chapter 5 verse 4. He is not a God that has pleasure in wickedness. See, all these verses, if the Bible is true... It's telling us that this verse can't mean something that the world wants you to believe that it means. We know, don't we, that, and we've already talked about it once, that the original creation involved nothing evil. Some people ask the question about Satan. We know the original creation involved nothing evil because the Lord saw everything that He had made and behold, it was very good. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. The language there does not allow any room for any wickedness to have been involved in the original creation. God, also from the book of Isaiah, uh, through the prophet Isaiah, prophetically mentioned a man. You've heard, you've heard others speak about him before, and you've read about him in your Bible. He, he prophetic, prophetically mentioned King Cyrus of Persia. You remember King Cyrus? In, one of the interesting things about... Isaiah mentioning Cyrus is, it was 150 years before Cyrus was born. Okay, so what we're fixing to talk about uh, was a century and a half before the king of Persia was even born. And when, within Isaiah chapter 45 verses 1 through 7 is the affirmation uh, of the sovereignty of the Almighty God. His intention, his stated intention in Isaiah 45 of this man who hadn't even been born yet was that he was going to use Cyrus who was going to be a pagan king as an instrument of his holy will. He was going to work out his will using somebody that had no regard for God, had no desire to be obedient to God, and he was going to use him mightily indeed. Uh, uh, within uh, Isaiah is proof that God is sovereign and He is almighty. In verse 5, it says, there is none like Him. He also says, Isaiah says, He affirms God, I form light, and catch this, create darkness. Similar language to what we read earlier, and that literally means that He controls nature. He goes on to say, I make peace and create, here's the word, just translated in the New King James Version with a, maybe a, a word that is closer to the original meaning, I create calamity. Some translations like the uh, King James of 1611 says evil. What he means there is I exercise control over the nations. I am Jehovah who does all these things. So God is saying this is my doing, that I create calamity. Now why would he do that? We need to notice that Isaiah contrasts the word evil in Isaiah 45 with the word peace. Peace, according to Isaiah, is the opposite of evil. It's not evil and good, it's evil and peace. So what is Isaiah saying? Isaiah was simply stating that Jehovah has the power to cause peaceful conditions to exist, and he also has the power to bring about calamity or destruction if that is in keeping with his will. Consider another passage. God warned the Israelites that if they made an alliance with Egypt, he would bring what upon them? Evil, or depending on your translation, desolation. Isaiah chapter 31, verses 1 and 2. Again, in describing the coming judgment upon ancient Babylon, the prophet declared this, 
Therefore, here's our word, evil or calamity or desolation shall come upon you. You shall not know from where it arises, and trouble shall fall upon you. You will not be able to put it off. And desolation, again that word, shall come upon you suddenly, which you shall not know. Isaiah chapter 47 and verse 11. So, the evil that's being discussed in this verse that people kind of get tripped up on is not the moral evil that we equate it with regarding wickedness. The evil that God is talking about creating and, and bringing into the world was that God sent a desolation due to nations because of their wickedness. God allowed nations to fall because they were unrighteous and they were not obedient to His will. Also, from Amos chapter 6 and verse 3, evil can also be used with a purely secular meaning to denote times of distress. Listen to what the prophet Amos said. Woe to you who put far off the day of doom. That's that word, the day of evil. Who caused the seed of violence to come near. And what he's talking about there is he's talking about a, a day yet in the future that's going to come where it's going to be extremely difficult. There's going to be great tribulation in the land. And he uses the same word there that's translated e uh, evil in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 7. That's exactly the meaning of what Isaiah meant in Isaiah 45 verse 7 was that uh, he was going to create circumstances in such a way that calamity or desolation would come upon the nation of Israel. So, did God create evil as we predominantly use the word to indicate moral wickedness? And the answer to that is, is simply no. He did not do that. He did not create that. Did He create a universe in such a way that physical injury, desolation, and distress can occur because of the circumstances of life? Yes, He did. Let's look at another familiar passage uh, to see Jesus' thoughts about this topic. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 13. This again is another passage that I, that I use a lot when I'm studying uh, the Bible with people who are interested in learning the gospel. Luke 13 verses 1 through 4. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? And again, he tells them, I tell you no, and unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What's the point? that Jesus is making in Luke chapter 13, 1 through 4. You know what he's doing? He's answering a, a predominant, a predominant uh, a way of thinking uh, from that time, and I would tell you it's pervasive even today, and that is bad things happen to bad people, right? Isn't that what, to go back to Job, isn't that what Job's three so-called friends were t uh, telling him? Obviously you've done something bad because of all this calamity, evil, desolation that has come to you and your family, you've obviously done something bad. See, that's the thing that Jesus was addressing with this. And he says, do you suppose that those people who, who Pilate sent out his, his guards and they slaughtered these people and they took their blood and they mingled it with the sacrifices of Pilate, do you suppose they were worse than anybody else in Jerusalem? What's the point? It's a rhetorical question, right? The point is, of course not. You know what was wrong? You know why they got slaughtered? They are in the wrong place at the wrong time. They were there when the guards came with their swords and their spears to find some blood to mingle with Pilate's sacrifice. What about the 18 the tower fell on? Do you suppose they were... Worse sinners than everybody else in Jerusalem? What's his point? No. Why'd they die? Because they were standing under a tower when it fell. And they died. You know what's interesting to me about this account is this is during a time 
when Jesus was performing miracles, right? Would it have been possible if it was God's will for Jesus to stop the tower from falling? Of course it would. It didn't. It fell and they died. So his point is this. The ultimate point he makes is we all got to be ready because we don't know when we're going to die. And so we got to repent. We got to be ready uh, for eternity, right? That's the ultimate point. But, but the other point he's trying to answer is, you know, sometimes things just happen. Circumstances just happen. And that is the exact same thing Solomon was teaching in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 11. Jesus and Solomon were perfectly in harmony with this concept. Solomon said, I return and saw unto the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. You know what? You get out on the parkway and an 18-wheeler loses control and turns over on top of you, you're going to die or you're going to be severely injured. It's, and that has nothing to do with your goodness or badness. It has nothing to do whether you're righteous in the sight of God. That's the point Jesus is making. So the default position of biblical critics is to redefine evil to include any kind of suffering, any kind of distress, any kind of pain. And since... There is suffering and distress. They claim that this is proof that there is no God. Folks, this is the so-called, by them, the so-called problem of evil. You see, people who don't believe in God depict God as all-loving as well as all-powerful. Is that true? Yeah, it's true, right? They're right, right? Because the Bible depicts God as all-loving and all-powerful. We have no disagreement with them there, do we? Because that's exactly the picture that the Bible points. Uh, you can look at 1 John 4, 8, Genesis 17, 1, Job 42, 2, Matthew 19, 26, and a host of other passages to talk about the fact that God is uh, all-loving and all-powerful. Yet, everyone, believers in God and non-believers, admit that evil exists in the world. For God to allow evil and suffering either implies, according to them, that He is not all-loving or He is not all-powerful. He lacks the power to eliminate the suffering. In either case, according to them, the God of the Bible would not exist. To phrase the problem of evil more precisely, precisely the atheist contends that, that you and I, if we are defending our faith, right, 1 Peter 3.15, if we are Christian apologists, right, making our apology, our defense of the belief system that we have, uh, we cannot consistently affirm all three of these propositions. God is all-powerful, God is perfect in His goodness, and evil exists. The atheists insist that if God is all-powerful and if He is perfect in goodness, then evil cannot exist in the world and suffering cannot run rampant in the world as it is. Would you, would you agree with me that today there's a lot of suffering in the world? There is. There's a lot of physical suffering, a lot of emotional suffering, a lot of suffering in the world. Certainly it is in the world. If, on the other hand, God is perfect in goodness, but He lacks the power uh, that the Bible claims that He has, His goodness should move Him to exercise His power to eliminate evil on the earth. That's what they would say. And so their point is that He obviously is not all-powerful. So since you and I would affirm all three of those things are true, He's all-loving, He's all-powerful and evil exists. The atheist claims that we're inconsistent. We're guilty of affirming a logical contradiction, a conundrum uh, that we cannot successfully uh, deal with, and therefore our position is false. 
this in their mind presents an insurmountable problem for you and I. So, again, because we want to be able to defend our faith, how do we answer this? This supposedly insurmountable problem. Well, we must come to a reasonable conclusion. What Isaiah say in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Come let us reason together. Why should we do that? Because we need to have a reasonable conclusion about difficult topics. Would anybody disagree that this is a difficult topic? I don't think anybody would. Nobody that I know that, that knows anything at all about the Bible would say this is not a difficult topic. And it's mainly dif difficult because it takes so many people away from God. And we have to deal with that so we can win their souls. In order to answer this question successfully, we must explore this. This is the key. If you're taking notes, this is the key. We have to explore the purpose of of human existence. Why are we here at all? That's the only way you can answer this reasonably in a way that will satisfy and should satisfy a reasonably minded person. Does that mean everybody's going to agree with you after you do it? Nope. It's not going to happen. Will some? Yes. If you make a reasonable defense for what you believe, some will come around on this topic. Many of you have heard uh, the name Thomas B. Warren. Uh, Thomas B. Warren completely undercut, undermined the atheist use of the problem of evil. He writes and demonstrated that the Bible teaches that God has a morally justifiable reason for having created the world in which evil can and does occur. You understand what he's saying? He's saying he has a defensible reason for God doing what he did in creating the universe and the world in such a way that evil can exist. Suffering can exist. He's saying there's a good reason for it. What is that reason? Here's the answer. God created this planet to be the ideal environment for soul making. For making our souls pleasing to God. He made this planet and our universe perfectly in order for us to do the things in this life that would be pleasing to God so we could spend eternity with Him. Folks, that is the sum of the purpose of the existence of human existence. God specifically created humans to be immortal. We have a soul that will live on forever somewhere. He created us as free moral agents. The people that we're talking to about this topic don't believe that. They don't believe that there's anything such as free moral agency. They believe that God created us uh, like robots where we really don't have any free moral agency, that everything's predetermined, uh, and if there is a God at all. Uh, he created us in such a way that we're responsible for our own actions. God does not hold the sins of other people against other people. Only the sin, the person, the soul that sins will die, right? And the point that God's making there is we're responsible for our, our own choices and our own actions. He also stated, Brother Warren also stated that this earthly life is the only one we have the only probationary period we have in which our eternal fate is determined by our response to God's will during our earthly life. That's why we're here. We're here to prove to God we want to spend eternity with Him forever by living according to His will. Therefore, Brother Warren concludes, the world is as good as any possible world for the purpose God had in creating it, since it was designed to function as man's place or location of soul making, soul molding into the image of Christ. The physical environment in which humans were to reside was specifically created with the necessary characteristics for achieving that central purpose. He did it perfectly. Everything he created, including the possibility of there being suffering and pain, 
was made on purpose to prepare us for eternity. It also was there to help us understand that this life is fleeting. This isn't the end. There's something better than this at the end. Uh, this environment would have us to be uh, so arranged that it would allow humans to be uh, free moral agents, provide us with our basic needs, and allow us to be challenged and enable us to learn those things that we most need to learn to please God. The atheist typically defines evil as physical pain and suffering. Here's the problem. That's not how the Bible describes evil. You know how the Bible describes evil? The definition of the Bible has for evil is a violation of God's law. That's it. It's not pain. It's not suffering. It's a violation of God's law. So we're mixing terms, right? When we're talking to somebody about evil, they're thinking any kind of pain or suffering is evil. God doesn't look at it that way. Pain and suffering is intended to cause us to mature and grow in our moral character. 1 John 3, 4 says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So in God's eyes, which is what we should be looking at, right? The only intrinsic evil is sin. Disobeying or transgressing the laws of God. We cannot look at calamity or desolation as evil. Why? Because God doesn't. There's a purpose behind it. Do we absolutely every time know what God's purpose is behind it? Of course we don't. But there is a purpose behind it. In fact, Brother Warren concludes his statement by saying, animal pain, natural calamities, and human suffering are necessary in the overall environment designed for spiritual development. There is no other way to have done it to eliminate those things in such a way that you and I could still be free moral agents. If God stopped us, Dale, from going out to the chicken coop to grab the chicken and wring its neck or cut its head off to have chicken for dinner, if He stopped us from doing that, which is would be stopping us from causing animal pain, right? then we would no longer be free moral agents. So because we're free moral agents and because he's given us after the, after the flood, he's giving us all these animals to eat, it's necessary for us to do that. And that's something that is not evil, uh, even though many people in the world believe it to be. Um, this also demonstrates that life on earth, we mentioned it a second ago, is brief. Our life on earth is very brief, even, even for those that have been for, around for a while. James calls it a vapor in James chapter 4, verse 14. And these realizations that God made it perfectly with the intended purpose of preparing us to go to heaven should propel people to consider their spiritual condition and should cause us to consider the necessity of using this life to prepare for the afterlife and should prod people to contemplate God. Suffering, pain, and hardship encourage people to co cultivate their spirits and to grow in moral character. And suffering can serve as discipline and motivation to spur spiritual growth and strength. It literally stimulates people to develop compassion, sympathy, love, and empathy for their fellow man. Without Without, Dale, I know you do it, and, and Janelle, you work in the hospital. I'm sure you see it all the time, and there's maybe others here that do as well. Uh, there's something powerful about watching people care for others that they love. There's something powerful about watching that compassion and that empathy, uh, which we would not know about if there wasn't suffering in the world. We would not develop those characters characteristics if there was not suffering in the world. What's the conclusion of this? I don't know what time we're supposed to stop, but we're, we're going to tie it up here in a second. What's the conclusion to this lesson? Just to sum it up, why does God allow evil to exist in the world? Well, first we talked about the fact that we first need to ask, why does God allow good to exist in the world? And the reason for that, as we studied, was because He's an inherently good God. He, he's all loving, and He wants us to go to heaven. That's why He allows good in the world. That's why He has gifted us 
with the blessings that He showers upon us. Every good and perfect gift. Every good and perfect blessing. Everything that's good comes from God. Also, the existence of evil prepares us for eternity because it forces us to choose. God wants us to choose good, not evil. God never intended for us to be robotic in nature, simply doing what we had previously been hardwired to do, as if we had no choice. He has blessed us with choice. The existence of evil forces us to deal with difficult situations. And you know what? God wants us to deal with them righteously and faithfully, even in the most difficult of situations. The existence of evil helps us focus on the long view, our ultimate goal and eternity in heaven. Instead of the short view, what are we suffering through right now? Is it easy for us to to focus on and and get that tunnel vision on what we're suffering through right now? The, The difficulties of life. I don't know about you. Maybe I'm the only one. I don't know. It's easy, isn't it? To just focus on what's going wrong in our lives or our immediate Uh, family's lives instead of looking at the long view. Well, how is this preparing me? How is God going to use this, work this thing together for good to those that are the called and uh, according to His, that love God and are called according to His purpose? And lastly, the existence of evil helps us develop the kind of moral character that pleases God. And ultimately, isn't that what we all want? Ultimately, what we want is for God to say, well done, good and faithful servant, right? And that, that's the whole point of this topic and why we need to look at it very thoroughly so that we understand it, so we can defend it against those who would say, this is, this is the real reason why we don't believe in God, is because there's pain and evil and suffering in the world Well, that is not looking at it from a biblical standpoint. It's looking at it from an emotional standpoint. Any of you like pain and suffering? Any of you like it when your family suffers? No. None of us do because God created us as emotional beings. But the fact of the matter is is that the faithful Christian understands that something good, even in things that are bad, God will ultimately use to prepare us for heaven, even the most difficult times in our lives. If you have a need tonight, whether it be to be baptized into Christ or come back to Christ, if you have fallen away, please let that need be known as together we stand and sing the song of encouragement. Jesus, for the cleansing power.